everyone. I'm Kelly Weiss. I'm the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications at the Law School. Thank you for being here for the continuation of our Racial Justice Speaker Series. I'm going to give a few quick house rules before we get started. So throughout the presentation today, um, we will all be on mute. And after um, Dean Richardson has finished her talk, we will take questions and answers. Um, that will happen through the chat. And you can send your questions to me directly, and I will then ask the question for a response. Um, also, we will be offering MCLE credits to those attending. What you need to do is wait for an email from O'Neill Barrios, and he will send that after the event. Um, and that will be coming to you if you indicated when you signed up that you would like to receive those credits. And lastly, uh, today's event will be recorded and we will be posting that in the coming days. Um, and you can find that on our website at law.ucdavis.edu. We have a special page for this speaker series. So with that, I will now turn it over to Dean Johnson. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Uh, last fall, we commenced our racial justice speaker series to discuss some serious social justice and racial justice issues in our criminal justice system, but more broadly in our society at large. Uh, we've had a, an incredible array of speakers and we were very fortunate to have, have a, a superstar here today with us. Uh, Dean Song Richardson of University of California Irvine School of Law uh, is an expert in criminal procedure, criminal law and law and social science. She, she, besides being Dean, uh, she's the Chancellor Professor of Law and has many joint appointments uh, at, at UC Irvine. Uh, also, and we all should congratulate her, effective July 1st, she will become the president of Colorado College. She earned her AB from Harvard College uh, and her JD from Yale Law School. Uh, she's published extensively as a, and is an international expert in criminal justice and race issues. And we're very lucky to have her with us today. The title of her talk is something that caught my attention. I'm sure I'll catch yours. Implicit bias in decision-making in the criminal justice system. Please welcome Dean Song Richardson. Thank you so much, Kevin. It is such an honor to have been invited to be part of this remarkable speaker series. And it's my honor really to, to be here. Um, I, I respect so much everything that you have done for legal education at UC Davis for scholarship in this important area. So again, it means a lot to me um, to be introduced by you and, and to be here with all of you today. Uh, so let me share my screen. Actually, before I share my screen, let, let me just describe to all of you what I intend to do today. Um, part of the reason I was excited to be to be here with all of you is, uh, as you can imagine, during these challenging times, I haven't had as much time as I would like to to focus on um, my own scholarship and, and thinking about these issues. And, and frankly, I, I do a lot of uh, talks to judges and to um, other organizations about implicit racial and gender bias. And I haven't focused as much in the criminal arena for a while. So this is such a great opportunity for me to start thinking again um, about the impacts of unconscious bias on our criminal justice system and on decision-making within the system. Uh, and what I want to do during the time that I have with you is to first have you experience yourself some of the ways in which our own minds work. Because as lawyers um, or as budding lawyers, we often think that we have a lot of control over what happens in our minds. And, and frankly, we actually don't have as much control as we like. And we don't have as much control as we like over the way that our, our minds work when it comes to issues of race um, and gender. My talk today will focus specifically on race. It'll specifically focus on anti-Black bias. Um, and the reason our minds don't have that much control over some of these issues is because of the world in which we live. So that's just the second thing I wanna say before I launch in um, to describing how our minds work. 
Because too often, I think when we talk about unconscious bias and unconscious racial bias, people assume that the importance of that is what's going on in our individual minds and that the answer to this is to change the way that our minds operate around race. And so I just wanna start out by saying the reason I have studied and continue to study um, implicit bias is not simply because of the pernicious effects it can have on our own decision-making and on the decisions of people within the criminal justice system, but also because the fact that these unconscious biases exist tell us something about the nature of the world in which we live, about systemic bias, about structural racism, anti-racism, anti-blackness, right? Like all of these things are manifested in our minds. And the reason they're manifested in our minds is because they actually exist in the world. And, and so I just wanted to make that structural point before I jump in. So let me share my screen. Okay, so as I mentioned, where I wanna begin is by talking about the way that our own minds work. Because if we understand the way that our minds work, um, then this point that I made earlier about how systemic racism, institutional racism, and all of that is embedded in our minds make more sense. Uh, and part of what I wanna do is take you on the journey that I went on myself when I started studying these unconscious biases because of the fact that I learned that I had them and that I acted on my own unconscious biases too. And the reason that shocked me so much is I went to law school to become a civil rights lawyer and then I practiced as a civil rights lawyer my entire career until I became a law professor. And I, in terms of my own racial background, I'm black, I'm Asian, I identify as female and uh, and still I am impacted by these unconscious biases and I needed to understand how that could possibly be. So I want you to experience some of what I experienced and I'm sure that many of you have taken the implicit association test, which is what I took. Um, but let me start with this slide. So I'm not in the same room with you, unfortunately, but as you take a look at this slide, ask yourself if you see triangles. And typically most people see triangles pictured in this slide. And what about the Star of David? And then Pac-Man, if you know what Pac-Man is, many of my students no longer know what Pac-Man is. <laughs> Pac-Man, you can see it right here, right? Actually exists on this slide, but there are no triangles and there is no Star of David. And yet if you see triangles or the Star of David, what it tells you is something important about the way your brains work. So what your brains do, because it tries to conserve its energy, is that it fills in missing pieces without you even thinking about it. So automatically, which means you have no control over it, quickly and unconsciously, your brains will fill in the, the lines here so that you see triangles or the Star of David or both. Or if many of you like me are sitting on a chair right now, you probably didn't give even a second's thought to what that object is and what you're supposed to do with it, right? Because again, your brain quickly, automatically and unconsciously, it understands what a chair is. It understands what you do with it without you having to expend any mental energy at all. And that's what your brains do. It tries to conserve energy so that you can focus your conscious minds on the things that are important. Like if you're a student preparing for class, for instance, right? So that's what your brains are doing all the time. So let me give you another example. And the only instruction here is I don't want you to read. So don't read, but wherever you might be, even if you can't speak out loud, it's really important for you to move your lips, right? So what I want you to do is to say the color, right? Say the color, but don't read the color and do this as quickly as possible while avoiding making mistakes, okay? Don't read, look at the color, say it out loud or move your lips if you can't say it out loud as quickly as possible while avoiding error. So I'll do it with you, at least the first couple ones, okay? Ready, go. Red, yellow, blue, green, brown. Remember, don't read, just say the color. Blue, brown, red, yellow, green. 
Fantastic, so let's do that again. Red, yellow, blue, green, brown. Don't read, just the color. Blue, brown, red, yellow, green. Okay, we'll do it one more time. Ready, go. Now, if you are doing this out loud, I know what happened here. It was really easy, right? The first few times, but then you got here and all of a sudden it was harder for you. Your reaction time, that's what social psychologists call it. And this is known as the Stroop test, but your re reaction time was slower. Why? Because what I asked you to do was unfair. It is impossible to stop yourself from reading in a language that you know how to read. It's simply impossible. So this gets again to the point of, we think we have control over everything that our minds and our brains do, but we don't. You can't stop yourself from reading. And so when the word and the color didn't match, your reaction time was slower. If, this, uh, if the language was a language that you didn't understand and you couldn't read, then your reaction time would have been the same. So I showed those slides to you for two reasons. One, so you can once again experience how little control you have over your minds. But secondly, when you take the implicit association test, the science behind it is the same. It is about your reaction time and how quickly and how slowly you react to faces and uh, words. Um, I'm not gonna go much more into the implicit association test. It is one measure of one way that we can try to get to what are our unconscious biases? Because obviously I can't ask you what they are because you have no conscious access to them. So social psychologists have found different ways of measuring our unconscious or implicit bias. And by that, all we're talking about is the associations that your brains make in your unconscious through constant exposure. And it's similar to, well, I'll get to this in a second. So where do our brains learn these associations, right? Where do they come from? Because in the same way that your brain has learned what a chair looks like and what you do with it because of constant practice, right? Constantly associating chairs with something that you sit on, we do the identical thing with people. And even though I don't have time to get into it, this is the point I made right at the beginning, the reason our brains associate certain social groups with certain stereotypes and attitudes is because we have learned it based on the centuries of anti-Blackness that we have lived under in this country. I'm not gonna go into all of that, I don't have time today, but more recently, you can also learn it from your parents, from your friends, from school. Children as young as five years old have the same unconscious associations that I'll talk to you about. People often ask me, how can that be? You can learn them from cartoons. So let me give an example, a few examples of how our brains learn these associations and why it can't be separated from the history of our country. So artificial intelligence, many of you know that in order for artificial intelligence, it learns through data, right? You feed data into the system, it builds an algorithm, and that's how these systems learn and evolve. So there was a group uh, who wanted to teach a particular AI system to understand the English language. And the way they did that was by feeding it data, and the data that they fed to it was all of Google News. Sorry, I have something in my eye all of Google News for a particular period of time. The system took all of Google News and learned, it built algorithms learning the English language. But then the researchers went a step further and they wanted to see just by reading Google News would this system develop the same unconscious associations that humans have. So for instance, like the implicit association test demonstrates, most individuals, regardless of their race, associate black men, black male faces with negative things and white male faces with positive things. Uh, most people, regardless of their gender identity, associate women with the home and men with leadership. So they wanted to see, would this AI system learn the same thing just from reading Google News in order to train itself? And the answer was yes. It had the same unconscious associations 
that humans have just from reading the news. And so if this happens to an AI system, it is no surprise that it happens to us as we're uh, ingesting the news every day. Or think about Siri. If you're like me, I use Siri for everything. The pre-programmed voice is female. And what do we use Siri for, right? To assist us. And so our brain is learning female voice assistant versus the Watson computer. The Watson computer, you'll remember one Jeopardy and they pre-programmed that voice as a male voice. And so our brain is learning male smart. That's how it works. And as you pay attention now, as you just walk around every day, you'll see the times your brain is practicing these associations. Here's another example. This is from a Delta Skyline magazine. And what's my brain learning looking at this? Men are leaders. Now, these unconscious biases that our brains learn, they impact us when decisions are ambiguous, when we don't have full information. So for instance, there was an orchestra, orchestras across the country uh, had difficulty hiring female musicians. And when you would ask them why that was, what they would tell you is the typical thing that you often hear. We just can't find female musicians who are as qualified. But there were some conductors and managers who didn't believe that. And so they decided that they would have musicians audition behind a screen. Now, it turns out that the way we hear music is impacted by our unconscious bias. So if someone's really terrible on the one hand or really fantastic on the other, you don't have to worry that much about the impact of our unconscious biases on our decisions, our behaviors, and our judgments. But in that large middle where it's a little bit ambiguous, that's when you have to worry. So when it came to these symphony orchestras, when people auditioned behind the screen, the number of women went up by 25 to 46%. And some orchestras had people take off their shoes or walk across a carpet, why? Because the click, click, click of heels across the stage can impact your brain. You thought female, and right? And so when you take off your shoes or walk across a carpet, the number of women hired went up another 10%. So how do these unconscious biases work? You categorize everything, including people. So just like you categorize a chair, you categorize me. So if you didn't know my racial or gender background, your brain has already within milliseconds decided for you within milliseconds. And that's because our brains have learned that race and gender are incredibly important to our culture. And it doesn't matter whether you're right or not about whatever category you put me in, but your brain has chosen within milliseconds. And after that, within a few seconds after that, it has applied to me whatever beliefs or stereotypes your brain has learned about whatever racial category you put me in, and then whatever feelings you have, positive or negative, about whatever racial or gender category you put me in. And again, this is happening quickly, and you are unaware of its impact on your decisions, your judgments, and your perceptions. By implicit, we just mean it happens automatically. You can't stop it. Just like you can't stop yourself from reading, you can't stop your brain from doing what I just explained to you. And then when we talk about bias, all I mean by that is that it has an influence, sometimes a negative influence, sometimes a positive influence. So bias is both negative and positive, and we'll see disparities within the criminal justice system, for instance, because of both. And finally, the more often your brain practices these, these associations, the quicker and stronger they become, the more quickly they're activated, the stronger they are. And as I mentioned before, even me, I have to worry about the impact of these unconscious biases on my own behaviors, decisions, and judgments. So what I want to do next is to, there are literally thousands of studies that I could choose from. I just want to share with you some of the studies about the real world consequence that are relevant to the real world consequences within our criminal justice system. I'll end with some of the structural systemic changes that can occur within the criminal justice system to address some of these consequences. And then um, I'm happy to take questions. So first, profiling. I already mentioned to you that you all already placed me within a racial and gender 
category, right? You could think of that as a, a type of profiling even when it occurs unconsciously. And what social psychologists have learned is that because the connection between criminality and race has become so strong, simply thinking about crime, consciously thinking about crime, activates thoughts of black people. And the result of that is our attention is drawn to black individuals who happen to be present in the environment. So you can imagine a police officer, right? Thinking about crime, his attention will be drawn to black individuals in the environment. So then what happens next? There are studies that demonstrate that the way we interpret ambiguous behaviors, because remember, we have to be most concerned about the impact of these biases in ambiguous situations. So imagine an officer, his attention is now drawn to more likely drawn because he's, he and she are drink, thinking about crime, black individuals versus white individuals. How will they interpret ambiguous behaviors? So let me talk about one study. And the reason I labeled this slide unconscious or implicit white favoritism is I don't want you to forget that. So unconscious bias can lead to more negative treatment of black individuals and more positive treatment of white individuals leading to disparities within our criminal justice system. So in this particular study, what the researchers did is they brought individuals into the lab and then they lied to them, right? <laughs> like that's often what happens in these psych experiments. You don't want the subjects to know what you're actually testing. And so they said to them, you're gonna be watching uh, a video live stream of this uh, discussion that two men are having in the next room. Uh, so just watch it and then we'll ask you some questions afterwards. But it wasn't true, right, that there was um, a live conversation going. These were pre-recorded videos of actors following a script. And in these pre-recorded videos, the conversation between the two men would get increasingly heated. And then one of the individuals shoved the other. And then it went on, but that was the important part, the shove. And it was ambiguous. And so after that, the subjects were asked to rate that shove either as playful and aggressive on the one hand, I mean, sorry, playful and dramatic on the one hand or violent and aggressive on the other. And they manipulated or changed the race of the men in these pre-recorded videos. So when both of the actors were white, only 13% found that shove to be aggressive and violent and dangerous. When both were black, that same shove was now viewed as violent and dangerous by 69% of the individuals. When the white individual was the shover and the black individual was the victim, 17% found that shove to be aggressive, but that went up to 75%. When the black individual was the shover and the white individual was the victim. So we can see both unconscious white favoritism, they're seen as less aggressive and unconscious black bias. And remember the shove was identical. So you can imagine the same thing happening to an officer on the street. His attention is drawn to black individuals first. There's something going on, right? He might not, the officer, even notice this ambiguous, playful and dramatic shove when the two individuals are white, but will certainly notice it and interpret it as more aggressive when black individuals are involved, especially when it's an interracial interaction. There are also, it also impacts how we judge black men versus white men, right? Black men seen as more physical, bigger, stronger, and thus it's more uh, acceptable for police to use force, even when the size is identical. How do these unconscious biases impact what we see? So the way that our brains work, and I could have done it with this slide, but I didn't. So if I were to flash pictures so quickly that you weren't even aware that you consciously, you're not aware that you've seen something, your brain is aware. And so in this particular study, they would flash either a black face, a white face, or the control, no face at all, so quickly that you aren't consciously aware that you've seen it, but your brain is aware. And so it triggers all of the unconscious associations you have learned to associate with black men, white men, or no man, uh, no face at all. 
And then they showed you these frames and they wanted to see how many frames would it take for you to figure out what was pictured here. And either what's pictured there is something relevant to crime or something completely irrelevant to crime. So this was a picture of a gun. So how many frames does it take for you to figure out that this is a gun? So when you didn't see any face at all, it took, it didn't matter whether it was a crime, whether it was an iron or not. So for an iron, it took about 24 frames when you didn't see a face at all. When you saw uh, a black face or where, where you saw a white face, the, the differences in these bars is irrelevant, right? So when you saw an iron or a teacup, it didn't matter what face you saw. But look what happens when you see the control. Again, no face, no difference, right, with a gun. But if you saw a black face, even if you weren't conscious that you'd seen it, look how quickly you, you can figure out that something is a gun versus when you saw the white face. It took more frames. So once again, the way that our unconscious brains work can affect how quickly we see items like a gun or a weapon. Memory. So this one is a jury study. And here, all the mock jurors read about a defendant. William makes our brains think white. Tyrone makes our brains think black. They read a scenario that had some ambiguity in it vis-a-vis -vis violence and aggression. Then they took the jurors, uh, distracted them for 15 minutes with something else. They brought them back into the lab and they asked them questions about the scenario they had just read 15 minutes before. And what they found is if people read about Tyrone, they remembered accurately about 80% of these ambiguous facts related to aggression. But if they read about William, they only remembered about 68% accurately. And they remembered facts of aggression that didn't actually even exist in the scenario they read. So once again, these are ways in which our unconscious biases can impact within the criminal justice system, our treatment of white individuals versus black individuals. What about evaluation of evidence? So here's another study involving a robbery in a convenience store and they shared evidence with these mock jurors that had nothing to do with guilt or innocent or was ambiguous vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis guilt or innocence. And then the two important photos were this. This one, you can see the forearm is a light-skinned forearm and other subjects saw a black-skinned forearm. Again, to trigger the unconscious biases that we have. And what was the result? with the ambiguous evidence that I just talked to you about. If they saw the lighter skinned forearm, they said that that ambiguous evidence was less probative of guilt versus when they saw the darker skinned forearm, that same evidence was more probative of guilt and they were more likely to convict the black versus the white defendant or suspect. Okay. So we've talked about profiling, how ambiguous behaviors can be interpreted, the what we see is impacted, our memories are also impacted. I'll share one study, I'm just looking at the time, uh, regarding sentencing. And this is death penalty sentencing. Uh, and you probably won't be surprised at all by the results of this if you're familiar, as I'm sure all of you are, with the Baldus study. So this comes from Jennifer Everhart's 2006 article. And what they were looking at, and these are people who were actually sentenced to death. And they wanted to see, is there a relationship between how black you look? That's what they mean by Afrocentric features. So this individual has more Afrocentric features than this individual does. Uh, and they looked at actual death sentences to see the more Afrocentric features you have, does it impact whether you were sentenced to death or not? And the answer is yes. So if you look at the top graph, these are black defendants with white victims. And they controlled obviously for, for each of these cases, right? They controlled for all the other factors except for what your facial features look like. 
So here, if you had less Afrocentric features versus more Afrocentric features, you received a death penalty. The percentage of you being sentenced to death is about 20% versus 60%. And it only mattered with white victims. When there were black defendants with black victims, it didn't make much of a difference. Now, importantly, I should say before I finish up with the, the studies and go into what can we do or how should we think about it, I'm about to end soon, is um, of course there are bigoted people, racist people, obviously that exists. I don't care to address that. When I talk about, and the reason I talk about unconscious racial biases, like I'm talking with you about, again, is for two reasons. One, it just demonstrates what so many of us, I'm sure here today, don't need demonstration of. The fact that racism continues to exist systemic and individual, right? Because that's why it then becomes embedded in our minds. That's one point. But secondly, I also care because those of us who want to do the right thing, those of us who are consciously egalitarian, we too can be impacted by the unconscious racial biases that our brains have learned by living in the society in which we live. That's why I care about these things. Um, the final thing I'll talk about is the way that unconscious bias can impact our behaviors and I'm gonna bring in one more concept, something called racial anxiety because the behavioral effects are the same. So let me describe racial anxiety first and then let me talk about the behavioral effects of both. So racial anxiety is a whole other set of studies and what that refers to is the discomfort, the anxiety most people feel prior to and during an interracial interaction, right? Interracial interactions, especially with people we don't know are anxiety provoking. So if you're, I'm gonna talk about the white black interracial um, uh, interaction. So if you're a white individual about to engage with me, you might be worried that you will do or say something that will make me think that you're a racist. And that causes anxiety in you. For me, if I'm going to engage with you and you're white, I might be anxious both before and during our interaction that you are gonna treat me differently because I'm black. So we are both anxious even when we really wanna engage with each other. And what happens when you're anxious? It affects your nonverbal interactions. You make more speech errors, you make less eye contact, you're you stand further away, you appear really uncomfortable. And on top of that, when you tell yourself, like you know that I'm black and so you might be saying, don't ask Song about whether she likes fill in some stereotypical thing, right? You, you tell yourself not to do that or not to say that. And how does your brain react when you do that? It brings whatever it is that you told yourself not to do to the forefront of your memory so that it can follow your instruction not to do it. But when your brain does that, it makes it far more likely that you're gonna say or do exactly what you told yourself not to do. And so when both of us are anxious and both of us are engaged in those behaviors that I just described to you, it, it, and then there's a self-fulfilling prophecy effect. So when you act a certain way, I mirror your behaviors without even realizing it. So you can imagine how an interaction can go wrong very quickly. And there are studies that demonstrate this. And the reason I share this with you is not only in the criminal justice situation where you have police citizen interactions where this anxiety can be impactful. And there are studies about the way it, it impacts police uses of force in ways that are counterintuitive, I'm happy to answer during the Q&A. But it also, I raise it because too often we are looking for the bad apple, right? Whereas yes, there are bad apples, but we have to care more about the barrel, right? Changing the systems and structures. Um, but to the extent that we're also looking for that bad apple, sometimes in these interactions, you think someone is a racist when consciously, I mean, when that could be incorrect. Because with some of these studies, sometimes it's the person who cares, the, the most consciously egalitarian person who cares so much about what I think of them that says and does 
the terrible thing. So I think it's important to talk about racial anxiety too. I'm just gonna skip through this to say that the way that these unconscious biases can impact the criminal justice system is at every discretionary point, whether the police recognize or, or are focused on you all the way to sentencing. Every single discretionary point, we have to worry about the ways in which these biases can impact us. In terms of if I, I'm not gonna get through all of my slides, so I just wanna show you this, right? These are the situations, the circumstances when we are most likely to act on our unconscious bias. It's those moments where you're not really thinking, you're on autopilot and your brain is just filling in the missing pieces based on what it has learned, the way AI systems have learned living in our society is the right answer. And so, as we think about our criminal justice system and individuals within those systems, I was a public defender for most of my career. I was stressed, overloaded, always on time pressure, always exercising discretion without full information. Of course, I'm acting then on my unconscious bias. I speak to a lot of judges all the time and public defenders and prosecutors, but judges take a lot of these um, implicit bias trainings, I'll call them. I hate the word training because it's not a training, right? It, it is a way of at least introducing people to one aspect of how uh, the way that we think, the way we make decisions can be impacted by things outside of our control or that we are unaware of. And so I give a lot of these, um, this introduction to some of this to judges. And yet I hear later that they go back to their courtrooms and they do the same things. And by do the same things, what do I mean by that? Hurry it up, counsel, right? Hurry it up, we don't have time for this, let's move quickly. That is a structural problem, right? The moment you say that, or if you're a public defender who, and you work in an office where you don't have, uh, the head of the office who will be supportive of you like I was lucky enough to have where a judge would pressure me to move quickly and I would say, I can't, I won't, I will not hold me in contempt if you want. Of course, as a public defender, sometimes you do want things to move quickly, right? I'm talking about those cases where you don't, where you are unprepared, where you don't have time. If we continue to act this way within the criminal justice system, then I think, this is my own personal opinion now, that we are just as culpable as the bigot is. So I don't care if you're a public defender, if you're a prosecutor, you're a judge, you're a probation officer, a jury, it doesn't matter to me. If you decide that because our criminal justice system is broken, but we will still move on and move quickly and do all the things that we do in the criminal justice system. We are just as culpable as the bigot because we know what the result is. We are saying it is okay for us to be impacted by so much, including our unconscious biases. So when we think about how do we fix it, of course, there are things we can do as individuals. Don't make decisions. Um, tell the judge, I am not gonna move forward when I'm not ready, or I'm not gonna make sentencing decisions when I'm overwhelmed and stressed out and I have too much to do. Those are some individual things that we can do, but individual is insufficient, right? And we, we should be thinking about and talking about what are the structural changes, and people are doing that now, right? And in, in so, so much, and I'm happy to talk about that, but I, I just wanna end there that we have to think structurally, we know that, so that it doesn't matter whether I'm a bigot or not, whether I uh, am unconsciously biased or not. It won't matter because the structures are in place to, to safeguard us within the criminal justice system. So I, I had a lot more slides, but I'm not gonna go through them. I'm instead just gonna end there because we have about 20 minutes left and I wanna make sure uh, that I have time for questions. So thank you. I know I've done a lot of talking, <laughs> uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that, that people might have about what I was able to share.
Okay, thank you. And I'd like to invite everyone to send questions to me through the chat um, and we can get started with our, our Q&A. We are waiting for some questions. To okay, well, I, I will, as, as we're waiting, I'll share, um, just interrupt me, but I can, I can share some of the things I, I didn't share. I, I wanna talk about what the federal courts have done in Washington state. So I worked with the, the, the federal district court in the Western district of Washington, where I used to practice um, along with the, the US attorney at the time, the federal defender at the time, and then people within the civil justice system. And we all came together because Judge Kunauer of that court and uh, Judge Richard Jones, they really wanted to figure out what they could do in the federal system to make some change within how their cases were going to try to figure out how to deal with the, the issues of, of race. Um, and, and so they did. And one of the things, if you ever practice in federal court, you will know um, that you rarely get to question, you rarely get to, ex to engage in voir dire. It is so rare as to, you know, I, I, I think I only did it once when I was in, in federal court as a federal defender. Um, and what Judge Richard Jones was, did in a case that involved a black defendant, it was a black defendant and a white defendant in, or a white um, witness, but there was a question about who was actually guilty here. And what Judge Jones allowed was individual voir dire. It was amazing. And not only that, what he also allowed was the, if you ever seen What Would You Do? It's a TV series. And one of the, uh, one episode was about people stealing a bike in a park. And the question was, what would you do if you saw this? And so one individual was a black individual who had burglar tools, was cutting the chains off the bike. Uh, and then they had a white individual and then they had this beautiful woman and they wanted to see how people would react, right? So when it was the, beautiful woman, people were dumping their bikes to run up to help her, right? Cut the chains off the bike and steal it. When it was the black individual doing the same thing, people were yelling and screaming and calling the police. And when it was the white male, it was kind of a mix between the two. What Judge Jones allowed in his federal court case was a clip of that series to be shown to the jury pool without the sound. And then he allowed the federal public defender and the U.S. attorney to question the juries in order to uh, figure out who the 12 were going to be who sat in that case. It was remarkable. And for the jury, afterwards, we got to speak to them. They said it was impactful. For It, it increased their um, the legitimacy of the criminal justice system. That race was something that was talked about this explicitly in that courtroom. They also have a five minute jury orientation video that they created that is shown right after Justice O'Connor's uh, video to a jury pool is shown that talks about unconscious bias and how it might impact decision-making and why it's important to talk about race and these issues in the jury room. They did that. They have jury instructions. Uh, so there are things that courthouses across the country are doing. Um, anyway, I don't know if there are any questions that I can keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do. We do have some questions that okay. come in, um, and one uh, actually uh, regarding the courts. And um, Rebecca writes, "What advice do you have for low-level misdemeanor courts in terms of how they schedule cases to avoid those atmospheres?" Um, I'm running to be a judge in Buffalo City Court as a public defender now and want to change how we assign 400 cases to a judge all at once. So what a great question. I, I'm sure that you are already aware of Sasha, Professor Sasha Nadapoff and her book on misdemeanors. She was a professor at UCI Law. She's now a professor at Harvard Law. Very sad for us, very lucky for Harvard. But she wrote um, a book on misdemeanors and she is gathering together people exactly like you to study exactly these issues. Because what you mentioned is 
well, first of all, right, so many cases are misdemeanors. It has far more impact than any, almost any other type of case that we have in our criminal justice system. And we have not typically taken these cases seriously despite the enormous impact it has on people's lives. And so, yes, when you get 400 cases at once and no one takes them seriously and they're just expecting you to cycle through those cases as quickly as possible, that is exactly the situation where we have to be concerned for so many reasons, not just because of unconscious bias. And so the reason I am not answering your question, but asking you to get in contact with Professor Nadapoff is this requires a structural solution, right? You can't do it alone. And she is bringing uh, judges together who practice in municipal courts across the country to figure out the structural answer to this question. So I, her name again is Sasha Nadapoff. She wrote the book Misdemeanors and she's at Harvard Law School. Great. Thank you. Um, a question from Henry, who writes about systemic liability rules that he's, that he's inquiring about and says, um, for example, what about removing qualified immunity from institutions uh, regarding implicit bias? So qualified immunity has been such an incredible hurdle especially in the, the area in which I'm most familiar um, with it is in with, with police officers, right? Going after the bad Apple police officer. Now the, uh, the Floyd Justice and Policing Act, like that would address the issue of qualified immunity. And I think that is legislatively, because with the courts it has been impossible um, legislatively to deal with the issues of qualified immunity, I think are critically important to do. It, it is what allows us to, to punish, right, individual officers. I'm just talking about um, uh, police departments, but also to hold municipalities accountable, right? Putting some incentives in place so that we don't just blame one individual officer, but we look at the entire structure of our police departments, the entire structure of the way that our courts are, um, uh, are, are, are put together and, and work, right? Like those are the types of discussions that so many scholars have been having, including your own dean, right? Kevin Johnson, like thinking about structural changes that will really make an impact, I think are the important and impactful ways of, of really making a difference here. Uh, speaking of, of structures, um, that is uh, something that Dean Johnson actually did send a question about, and uh, maybe we can continue on that thought. Uh, and, and he asked about how should we start our effort to transform the structures that allow implicit bias to operate freely in the criminal justice system? So that is such a great question. And the only addition to that question that I will have is it's not simply, although it's not simply about implicit bias. And I know I just gave this whole talk about implicit bias. And the reason I do is the connecting point for me is even those of us who think that we wouldn't act on, that we aren't impacted by, by race and other social characters, we are. And the reason that we are is because we live in a racist society. And the impact of those structures of systemic racism are still, we're, we're still seeing it today. And that's why our brains are just learning it from living, right? Just from being out in the street, just like that AI system learned it from reading Google News, right? Like that this is the world in which we live. And so as we think about the different ways to transform our criminal justice system, I certainly don't have all the answers. The movement for black lives and the work that they have been doing to reimagine what policing or lack of policing or defunding policing, all of that work, all of that, that is the way forward, right? We can tinker 
with the things that exist in our current criminal justice system. And I think it's important to do that because until changes happen, this is the system we have. And so let's figure out what we can do within the system while it's still working, while simultaneously figuring out, which we haven't done until recently with the movement for black lives. What is it that we imagine this system should be? Should we even call it a system? What are ways to get out of the ways in which we have been thinking about our criminal justice system and reimagining it as something else? And there is so much that has been, there is so much out there already. We don't have to begin from scratch, right? People have been activists, scholars, have been thinking about these issues for decades. And so the question for me is how can we really transform what this system looks like? And I don't have those answers, but there was a lot said about that, Dean Johnson. I wish I had those answers. You, you, you have examined many of these issues yourself and your own work. And so my my question really is, how can we do how can we make it happen? And, and we're seeing some, we are seeing some changes, some progress, some movement. But is it too small? Is it too incremental? Right? These are the these are the questions that are being debated really in, in real ways. I, I feel much more hopeful today than I did before because we're actually having these conversations. People are getting even more upset right, about these issues. And for me, the anger and the upset from the other side of people who don't want the changes says to me, we are doing something right because they're, they're taking it seriously. Okay. I have a question from Bill who says, are there similar studies on implicit bias involving Asian or Latino defendants? So there is a bias in the literature, um, which is why most of my focus has been on uh, anti-Black and pro-white unconscious bias. There are, I'll just share uh, a couple. There, there are increasingly more. Um, studies involving additional groups. I'll just share one uh, quickly, and this involves Asians, and this was a study done by um, UCLA law professor Jerry Kang, and it's about our ideal litigators white. And basically what the researchers did is they had a, a, a deposition, a recorded deposition that was identical, but to trigger unconscious bias, what they did with the subjects who listened to these depositions is show them a photo of an Asian gentleman or a white gentleman. So after listening to the deposition, they then asked the subjects, which lawyer would you hire? Which one would you recommend to a friend? Which one did you think was the most effective? And it turns out that unconsciously we think white litigators, we think litigators, effective litigators are white. Because even though it was an identical deposition that they heard, they preferred whiteness to Asian litigators. And so in another series of studies um, involving similar recordings like this, if you show someone an Asian versus a white face, people hear an accent and broken English even when it doesn't exist, when they think they're listening to someone Asian versus white. And then we're seeing the impact of anti-Asian bias right now in the world of COVID in which we're living, right? Like that's conscious. Like I, I wouldn't even put that in the same category as, as unconscious, but certainly because the conscious is occurring, it is also strengthening our unconscious biases about what we think when we see someone we categorize as Asian, right? That's how pernicious it is when we see our former president speaking, we disagree, or I do anyway, with everything that he stood for, everything that he was about. And what is my brain doing though? It is taking everything he says as another instance to practice the negative problematic associations, right? Because my brain is agnostic, it doesn't care, right? It's taking in information, building those associations, which then impact me when I'm not being careful. So that's how it, it, it works. I hope I answered that question. Well, we have time for a, a final question here. And this is from Emily who says, is it possible that our implicit bias was developed over time within our evolution? Or it's something that's always been innate within us? I know that's a big question, but I'm interested. To uh, so I, I guess I'll answer it in by, by saying, our brains have always operated like this. 
right? In order for us to survive as long as we have, our brains have to operate like this. And so our brains are hardwired, right? To be stressed out basically, right? To look for danger, to categorize things quickly, to know like, do I move forward here or do I retreat? Do I run away or do I move towards? Um, and building these associations so that your brain can make really quick decisions because sometimes you must in order for, for survival. So the fact that our brains do this about race and about other social categories is hardwired in. It's no different than the associations you make about a chair, but the impacts are. And so our brains are hardwired to, to be fearful, to be stressed out, right? I mean, th 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 that is the easiest thing for our minds to do, which is why I'm gonna go off on a tangent for a second. Meditation is so important and keeping to account neuroplasticity and the fact that our brains can change. I mean, part of the reason for that, and it has been demonstrated to help reduce some of these unconscious biases because it helps you be more aware of what is actually going on in your head. So in answer to your question, is it innate? Is it hardwired? Yes, it is. Our brains work like this. Is it hardwired though that, that we, unconsciously associate bad things with groups who have been subordinated and positive things with groups who have been dominant over the course of centuries in our country? Is that hardwired? Um, no, we could do something about that. And I really hope that with the movements across the country, the movements for Black Lives, the anti-racism initiatives that are happening, the structural changes and discussions that we are having right now, maybe we can finally at some point live in a world where true equity is what we expect and what we have, but we are certainly not in that world right now. Well, thank you very much, Dean Richardson. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're optimistic and, and I like to be optimistic in this way too. It does seem that the activism and the consciousness of issue, the issues are at a place that they haven't been in quite a while. And yes. it's going to be increasingly important, I think, for activists to push this forward and not sort of um, let this moment um, fade away uh, because I don't think things are gonna change absent vigilance and activism. Totally agree with that. That's why our students are so important. That's why we do what we do, right? <laughs> they're, they're the future. Take care. Thank you all for being here. And uh, see you at the next lecture. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.